according to the Quran, to make them feel subdued. And that's a fancy way of saying, go violent, use terror, compel further and complete an unalterable submission. And I believe I know this organization and its people, and certainly its leadership, to be people who are not going to do that. And I hope this evening will be an important moment for you to become even more active than you have been to date in resisting the enemies of freedom, both Israel's and ours, both there and here. And we look forward to working with you to that end. Thank you very much. Before we take questions from the audience, could I ask you to speak a few minutes about Iran and uh, just to touch on that subject a little bit, if you don't mind? Um, well, Iran is kind of a lesser included case in everything that I just said. Uh, these are folks, of course, of the Shia tradition, but with the exception of some relatively fine points of Islamist theology, they're of a mind with their Sunni adversaries on everything I just said. The trouble is that they are a nation that despite, what is it now, a decade plus of economic sanctions, is close, very close, to realizing an ambition that the Ayatollah Khomeini and his successors have had for at least two decades. Namely to acquire and probably to be able to use nuclear weapons. No one can tell you with certitude how far off that day is. It's not to say that there aren't people who will tell you and the disagreements that we're hearing about it simply, I think, reinforce my point. Nobody knows. Certainly not anybody outside of a very small circle, I think, in, in Iran. But when the president said on the eve of his trip to Israel, to Israeli television, you don't want to cut this too close, my immediate reaction was, you have cut it too close. And when he went to Israel, and as I think Mort said, he said to the Prime Minister of Israel, we're going to cut it even closer. We're going to continue negotiating with the Iranians. When ladies and gentlemen, again, I know this is not a news flash to you, but there is no chance that these negotiations will do other than by the requisite time for the Iranians to finish the job. No chance. If there had been a chance, it was long past, but it certainly is no longer present. It's like a football player who sees daylight and is running for it. These guys are flat out, and they know nobody is going to stop them. At least if President Obama is successful in ensuring that the Israeli government won't make further and more successful efforts to do so. So I fear that the sh short answer on Iran is um, this is going to get very ugly. And, and tragically, it's not just Israel's problem. As you know, and I'd like to think everybody else knows, Israel is just the little saint. We are the great saint. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the uh, colorful and hopefully uh, short-timer president of Iran, has coupled his repeated declarations that Israel must be wiped off the map with his statement that a world without America 
is not only desirable, it is achievable. And if you'd like in q and I'll scare you to death about how we might have that in mind. But let me just say, I think this is a most worrying problem, and I uh, appreciate the chance to address it. Thank you so much, uh, Frank Gatti. I want to acknowledge Lois Levy, who is one of the sponsors, who is here tonight now. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge Richard Chait and Constantine Redukin, who are working hard to document this, this evening. Thank you, gentlemen. We have very limited time with Frank Gaffney. Please make it a question, not a statement, and make it as concise as you can. I'm going to start on this side. We'll work over to that side. Uh, gentleman in the purple tie. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Steve, Steve Max. Max, that's right, right. right. I knew that. Yes, uh, Mr. Gaffney, um, I once heard uh, Bernard Lewis talk about Dar al Islam and Dal al Harb. And to me, that seems like the most important, or one of the most important ways of, of letting people know that aren't sitting in this room, you know, people that don't agree with us, or you know, they might agree, but they're not willing to stand up, uh, that, you know, that is their ultimate goal, is to get everybody into Dar al Islam. And, you know, it's not in the, the Quran or the Hadith, but, you know, it is the, it is the way they live. So. I, don't, I don't know if everybody's familiar with that term. Dar al-Islam, of course, is the house of Islam. And it is meant to cover all parts, both present and past, I'm sorry. in which Islam rules. So there are large chunks, as you may know, of Europe that are considered to be Dar al-Islam, the rightful part of the Muslim world to be restored at the earliest opportunity, for which purpose jihad is to be pursued. Again, just to remind you, you use violence where you can, and where it may not be productive, you do what the Muslim Brotherhood has perfected, which is <coughs> use civilization jihad, stealthy techniques, to seek to accomplish the same ends, at least to create conditions under which violence will be conducive. Dar al-Harb is the rest of the world. And that literally translates into the house of war, which again, suggests that the Director of National Intelligence may not be fully on his game when it comes to talking about not just the Muslim Brotherhood, but Islamists more generally. As you've asked, and I think Bernard Lewis, at least in some phases of his writings, has made very clear, this is considered under Sharia, and it is indeed, I believe, in the Quran and the Hadiths. It's not, it's not simply stuff that's been cooked up since. Certainly most of what's been cooked up since is tied to, derived from, uh, rooted in these holy scriptures of the past. It is the obligation of the faithful Muslim to extend Dar al-Islam worldwide and eliminate Dar al-Harb through whatever means are propitious. Lois? that Aaron Klein is a dog. Uh, my question concerns the fact that the United States has had a long-standing policy of appeasement in dealing with Arab, uh, Palestinian Arab murders of American citizens. In particular, the Cleo Noel and George Curtis Moore, who were taken hostage March 2nd, 1973, in the, the Khartoum, Sudan. And as Arafat's right-hand man, Mahmoud Abbas has to have been informed about that, those murders, and he's been well rewarded. I understand he and his family are worth over $100 million, and never, nobody ever brings up the fact that he was involved in the murder of two American diplomats. Uh, could everybody hear the question? Well, the, the short form of it was that uh, we have turned a blind eye for years, our government, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, by the way, to evidence, some of it unimpeachable evidence, of complicity of Palestinian figures, including leadership figures. You mentioned Mahmoud Abbas, whom we've spoken, 
but also of Yasser Arafat in the murder of American citizens. And specifically was mentioned the 1973 murder of several of our diplomats in Khartoum. We've learned in recent years that the National Security Agency, the super secret snooping agency that monitors communications around the world, actually had wiretapped transmissions that showed Yasser Arafat not only knew of those murders, he ordered them. Three months after the murders. Three months after the murders, we knew of it. The point is that we have, in fact, turned a blind eye. Yes, we have, in fact, rewarded these folks. And I, I didn't get into all of this, and Mort is a, as a, an authority on it as well, but Bill Langfan has spent much of his recent years documenting the fraud that was perpetrated by our government and sadly the Israeli government in enabling Yasser Arafat to claim that he had amended the Palestinian Charter to eliminate all that nasty stuff about destroying Israel when in fact he hadn't done it and they knew he hadn't done it but by claiming that he had done it they cleared the way to begin making political concessions, to legitimate him, to establish the peace process which would result in the Palestinian Authority, and the rest, as you know, is history. Roberta, in the back. Uh, I'm very concerned that our administration is making, softening up the, the resolve of the American people with the sodas, the big sodas, giving up their guns, and they are making this sort of like a serfdom kind of uh, uh, Society, and I'm concerned because Germany and uh, and Russia had their citizens give up their guns, and we seem to be going to that trend. Well, I'm glad you got the big Slurpee in there too. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite made that connection so far, but uh, look, there, there's a nanny state issue that's going on, to be sure. Uh, and the gun business is, is, is troubling, I have to say. Um, one of the things that we're actively trying to get our head around is not simply the effort to remove our Second Amendment rights, but uh, what I'm sure you're hearing about a lot, as are we, of the enormous amount of hollow point ammo that is being bought by the U.S. government for the use of agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Services and the Department of Homeland Security and so on. And, uh, you know, what exactly that's about, I don't think we know, but I do think that combined with a general hostility to the Constitution of the United States, which, as I recall, this town had something to do with uh, uh, prominently, it, it's, it's really um, in the pantheon of things that we should worry about, I think it's up there. Uh, I don't know that it's the most urgent, but it is certainly one of the things I do worry about. Bob Gazzardi. Well, thank you very much. A ringer. Thanks for your insights. Uh, they have really been terrific. Uh, you too have been vilified, and I was wondering if you can discuss a little bit your experiences with CPAC, uh, Northwest, Silo, Cod, who they are, and the vilification from the Republican Party uh, for somebody who's been in the Reagan administration is an odd thing, but it would be informative for us to know a little bit about that. Well, thank you. This will take about six hours. <laughs> but fortunately, I've got it all on that video course. So MuslimBrotherhoodInAmerica.com, if you're interested, you can get the long version. The short version of it is this. Uh, I've spoken several times about uh, uh, Providence's hand at work here. Um, I happen to think that one of the providential interventions in my life was a most unlikely decision to share office space with a fellow you have heard mentioned and probably know something of at least, Grover Norquist, back in 1999. Uh, indeed, I signed a lease uh, to sublet space from him uh, for seven biblically long years. <laughs> and I say biblically long because about a month after we moved in, 
to space which involves sharing hallways and you know restrooms and elevators and a conference room and a Xerox room. Uh, Christine's predecessor came to me and said, do you know that there's a Muslim Brotherhood front on the other side of that Xerox room? <laughs> Which I didn't at the time, but I can assure you that in the succeeding seven years I had a lot of evidence of. Uh, it was called the Islamic Free Market Institute. And it was founded by Grover Norquist as its chairman, with funding and support from a fellow uh, you may have heard of, by the name of Abdurrahman Alamudi, who was at the time a big rainmaker for the uh, Democratic Party. He had been uh, so uh, favored by the administration for his help with bringing Muslim American votes and money to it that uh, he was made a goodwill ambassador for the United States to various Muslim audiences here and abroad. He was made a, an advisor, you can imagine how helpful this might be, an advisor to the Palestinian-Israeli peace process. And not least, he was given the authority, the first time, to become the recruiter, trainer, and credentialer of chaplains, Muslim chaplains for the United States military and the penal system. Now, interestingly enough, Mr. Alamudi is currently in the U.S. penal system. <laughs> he is a convicted terrorist having sought with funding from Muammar Gaddafi, the late and unlamented leader of Libya, to kill the present and unlamented king of Saudi Arabia. He was also a top Al-Qaeda financier and Muslim Brotherhood operative. And he created, I believe, without really any reservation, a group for the purpose of doing to the Republican Party and the conservative movement what he had already successfully done to the Democratic Party and the White House. Especially in the context of hedging his bets in the event that his friend Al Gore did not win in 2000. And this other guy. This guy who was tied, of course, to Karl Rove, who was very closely tied to Grover Norquist. So tied that, in fact, um, Grover Norquist managed to get the first executive director of this Islamic Free Market Institute appointed to be the Muslim outreach coordinator for the Bush 2000 campaign. He happened also to be Abdurrahman Alamudi's right-hand man for years, including waging jihad in Bosnia. But he also got, after the election, another Muslim Brotherhood operative. In fact, his parents helped found not only the Islamic Society of North America, the number one group, and the Muslim Students Association, the number two group on that list, the number three group on the list, something called the Muslim Communities Association, Suhail Khan, as the first Muslim outreach coordinator in Karl Rove's Office of Public Liaison in the White House which proved to be an extraordinary placement on 9-11 and immediately thereafter. And again, I'll leave you to look at the course if you'd like to see how that played out in terms of the impact in utterly undermining the Bush administration's understanding of the threat and its willingness to deal with it, which has metastasized unbelievably under this administration with all of the problems that we've already discussed. In short, thank you for the question, Bob. We have a cancer inside, those of us who are Republicans or conservatives, inside our community and movement. I was very pleased that despite the blackballing that Grover Norquist